Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here as we uh, begin spring semester. And I know Winter wanted to remind us that spring means different things um, this morning, but it's good to see you here. And we are reminded this morning that Jesus says, we're two or three or 11 are gathered. There we are. I'm there in, in your midst. And so we're great to see all of us. Great to see everyone uh, this morning. And as we gather together, we are reminded on this day that the God who was present with us in 2018 is now present with us in 2019. So we journey in faith, knowing that we're not sure where the road leads, but that Jesus travels with us. And we're thankful for that. Um, Ron, you are you? Good morning this morning. It's based on songs you know, I'm sure, except for one. The second song is by Paul Gearhart from the 1600s. All my heart this night rejoices as I hear far and near the sweetest angel voices. Christ is born, the choirs and singing, till the air everywhere now with joy is ringing. Does anyone know that text? So it's be sorry you don't have the words in front of you, but now you've heard them. <laughs>
Please join me in the prayer. Bright morning star, your light has come, and the birth of Jesus has overwhelmed us with joy. Like the bad time of long ago, may we be drawn to you and offer you such gifts as we are able. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 182, Bright and Best of the Stars. I'd like to say just a word. We all know fully, fully, fully by Reginald Keeper. Do you ever say, what else did that guy write to Look for the hymn book. He also wrote a great hymn for a hymn. I would do the best of the stars of the morning. And the third stanza of the mood changes. What can we possibly bring? What kind of relation can we bring? And the last, which by the way, great ones. It's a great hymn. Hope you'll welcome it into your vocabulary. I'll play it all the way through since it's new for most of us. treasures they offered him gifts 
gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Will you now join me in prayer? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. Are you a seeker? Are you a seeker? Ashton Summoner is a great place to be a seeker. Are you curious? I've always been curious about lots of different things. I read in lots of different subjects just because I'm curious. One of the great temptations I face when I work on sermons and do sermon preparation is that as I'm writing and working and looking and researching, I come across some information that's somehow connected but really not centrally connected to the sermon, and I'm so half tempted to go, oh, wow, that sounds interesting, rabbit trail. But I have to refrain from that. So I actually have a notepad by, a notepad by my computer, and I write down subjects for later research. Are you a seeker? Are you curious? I grew up in a church tradition, not the tradition I'm in now. I grew up in a church tradition that was in many ways very positive for me. But it was a tradition that did encourage a lot of questions. And I just can remember from the time I was young, even into my teen years, asking lots of questions. And the response I usually got, I usually got one of two responses. One was, well, pray about it, which is a good thing. I'm glad to pray about it. The other thing was, well, you know, don't, don't doubt, just believe. Not real helpful response when you're a seeker. I have to say that as a seeker, I do also find myself discouraged at times because I just don't have the answer to life's biggest questions. Jonathan, can you put the first, the first photo up there on the screen? Remember this? Have you seen this picture? Have you seen this photo? It went viral about six to eight weeks ago, and it's a photo of a young girl from Syria. And a photojournalist wanted to take her picture and asked her if she could smile. And you can see her attempting to smile through the tears in her eyes. This is a person who has, in her young life has only known war, devastation, destruction, death. She's attempting to smile through a life that for her has basically been suffering. And I ask God why. Now I could, I could give the big 35,000, we could fly 35,000 feet over the problem and I can give you all the theological and philosophical uh, answers to this. Well, you know, God by necessity builds freedom into the universe. We see this in the evolution of the universe itself and in the evolution of life on earth. And so freedom is, is a necessity that God builds into the universe and people can take that freedom and use it for destructive ends. Use it to keep or gain their own power and wealth and hurt people in the process. But I gotta tell you, as true as I believe that is, when I look into the, this face, doesn't seem like a very satisfying answer, does it? And so I ask, how long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord, will you allow the 21st century Herods to rule and to wreak havoc and death? Of course, then I have to ask, and God, where do you need to show me where I'm complicit by my way of life? And so I'm frustrated. I don't have all the answers. But here's one thing I know. And here's one thing I believe. I know that one day, this face up here, as well as the face of countless others, will finally receive justice. Who will receive what's right. Because we have a God 
who himself is identified with us. Next photo, please, picture. You see, our God in his love for us got personal. I am so glad that when God wanted to come into, or when God wanted to help a broken, hurting world filled with injustice, I'm so glad he didn't just give us another treatise. I'm so glad he just didn't send down a position paper. I'm so glad he did not form a committee. But what God did was he put on a human face, and that human face suffered and cried. And so the big problem I have is not that I don't think God's going to one day make everything right. The problem I have is I just sometimes lack patience. When will it finally be made right? You know, there are people who want to talk about the deity, the creator of the universe as some distant higher power, some God that created and went off into the corner of the universe to play one eternal game of solitaire. If that God exists, I have no time for that God. I'm not interested in that God. The Bible is really not interested in the question, does God exist? It assumes that. But the Bible wants to know what kind of God exists. And this God, this God who puts on a human face, and comes into the midst of our pain and sorrow and suffering and brokenness to do something about it, this is a God I'll worship. This is a God I'll follow. And so I know one day God will make all things right. I just need patience. I just need patience. But you know, it's another thing is I have to say, and maybe it's as you get older, I don't know, but with me, I, I have become okay with not having answers to all the questions in life. I've become okay with ambiguity. I've become okay knowing that God will work things out, and maybe I just need to wait for that. When I was young, college student, first started seminary, I had to have the answer to every question. I had to know. I had to know everything because, you know, one day God might need my advice. I still seek, but I'm content with unanswered questions this side of eternity. Have you know, ever noticed how curious children are? They have one, they have one favorite word. <coughs> Why? Last summer we were at my daughter's house and having a cookout, and I was sitting outside where they lived and our oldest granddaughter, who's now four, she was three and a half, little Allie, came up to me and grabbed my hand. She said, Gramps, let's go for a walk. And so we walked around their house. They're out in the woods. It's beautiful. And oh my gosh, the questions about grass and flowers in the grass and butterflies and insects. I got to tell you, I'm more comfortable fielding questions about atonement and trinity. But she wanted to know about insects. She was seeking. She was seeking. Of course, young children can get convictions real soon, too, because little Allie, in the midst of our conversation, wanted me to know, she wanted me to know that bugs are yucky. So maybe it's a reminder to us how important it is what we instill in our children. The convictions we instill at a young age that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. But you know what? When we become adults, it's not that we cease being seekers, but maybe 
Maybe when we become adults, it's just not natural to us the way it was when we were children. You know, perhaps the responsibilities of being an adult, of, 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 of having to work, get the paycheck, pay the bills, do all the other responsibilities that adults have to do, <coughs> maybe it becomes easy to put being a seeker behind us a little bit. <coughs> it finds it difficult to find time to seek. We're all seekers, but maybe, maybe at some point, once we grow up, we have to make sure we become intentional seekers. We make time to seek the questions of life. Well, for those of us who are seekers, and we're all seekers to some extent, and maybe some of the questions I have are different from the questions you have, but for the seekers, the church has a day for us every year, and it's on January 6th. It was called Epiphany. It was just this last Sunday. I reminded my congregation several times this year that Christmas is not over December 26th. It lasts till January 6th. Epiphany is a word that means manifestation or appearing or revelation, depending on the context, how you want to translate it. And it's during that season of Epiphany, which we're now in, that the church focuses on the earthly ministry of Jesus, his teaching, his life, his miracles, because we believe that in Jesus, the very God of the universe has revealed himself. In the Eastern church tradition, uh, on Epiphany, on January 6th itself, the focus is on the baptism of Jesus. But in the Western church, we Protestants and Catholics, we focus on the greatest seekers of the Christmas story, the Magi as we call them commonly, wise men. And for these, magi seeking was a full-time thing for them. Matthew uses the word magoi, magi, and it's related to the word magician. Magician. And so these ancient magicians were a combination of astrologers and chemists and astronomers they weren't kings, and we don't know how many there were, whether there were two, three, four, five. Matthew does not tell us. Of course, I'm glad we sang that hymn this morning, the first hymn, because it's got such a great message, and we need to keep singing it. And they traveled to Bethlehem. They're not Jews. I guess first century Jewish vernacular, they would be pagans. But of course, if they come from the area of Persia, which is what we believe, Persia was, of course, at one time ancient Babylon, and there was a Jewish population in Babylon that remained after the exile. So maybe, perhaps, these magi heard stories of this coming Jewish king, this coming Jewish deliverer. And then at some point, the sign appears in the sky, star, comet, whatever it might be. The sign appears in the sky in the direction of Jerusalem and those magi. Perhaps they say, hey, maybe that long-promised king that we've heard about, maybe that's, <coughs> maybe he's been born. Because for the ancient stars rising and falling, often suggested kings rising and falling. And so they're seekers. And they were really seekers because they traveled approximately eh, four to five hundred miles, depending on exactly where they were. I just find it so interesting, I have to tell you, I find it so interesting that the first persons to recognize, that among the first persons, among the first persons to recognize Jesus we're outsiders, we're strangers, and we're practitioners of things condemned in the law of Moses. I think at some point, I think it's true, that at some point all seekers may feel a little bit like outsiders because seekers are not afraid to ask the questions that the insiders would prefer to avoid. 
there are times when it seems that those who know the least about the faith seem to know the most. The chief priests and the scribes knew this prophecy, right? We're told that in Matthew, knew this prophecy of, of the Savior who would be born in Bethlehem, but they had missed the moment of its fulfillment. And Matthew says, once the word of these strangers reached the ears of the people of Jerusalem in the streets, all were told, all Jerusalem was frightened along with Herod. It's not a surprise Herod was not happy because there was no room in Herod's world for another king or a rival. But why would the people be frightened? You would think this news traveling the streets would be something that they would welcome. Could it be that the Messiah has finally come? Could it be that the Deliverer is here? Maybe perhaps after decades of suffering and oppression, maybe the people of Jerusalem found it hard to be seekers. Prolonged suffering as a way of just making us want to hang on, doesn't it? And just get through life. I remember many years ago in conversation with someone who had experienced much suffering in her life, she said to me, I can only focus on today. At the moment, there is no tomorrow for me. The curiosity of a promise fulfilled, the hope of deliverance, no longer seems to come naturally. Perhaps it takes outsiders to remind us of the importance of being seen. And so these wise men, these seekers were told, finally find the one they've been looking for, and they do the only thing possible. They honor him, they pay him homage, dare we say, they worship him. And they offer him gifts. Gifts of royalty, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then Matthew tells us after their visit, they go home by another way. They've been let in on Herod's desire not to go pay homage to this newborn king, but to get him out of the way. And so we're told they go back to their home by another way. Now, I have to tell you, sometimes when you read the Gospels, you get a hint that what the Gospels say on the surface is one thing, but maybe there's another meaning. Maybe there's something a little deeper in what they're saying. And you got to be careful when you do that, but is there something deeper going? I mean, on the surface, Matthew says the Magi go home by another route because they want to avoid the tyrant Herod from carrying out another tyrannical deed, one of many. Of course, we'll find out as we continue to read Matthew that will not stop him. But beneath the surface of this obvious meaning of Matthew and the Magi going by a different way, is Matthew maybe trying to hint to us that these seekers, after encountering Jesus, even without Herod, the Magi could in no way go back home in the same way. They had seen God incarnate. They had unexpectedly seen the fulfillment of their expectations as outsiders. And they were forced to go back another way. That is, they were forced to go back and to live lives that they would not have lived had they not encountered. And so I don't know what seekings and twistings and turnings bring people to see Jesus. I'm guessing there's a lot of them. But here's one thing I say today. Here's one thing I believe. That if we dare to do what the wise men did, if we dare to seek, if we dare to find Jesus, and if we dare to kneel before him and lay at his feet what we have to offer, God does not expect us to offer what we do not have. But if we offer what we have, and that is ourselves. If we offer ourselves to Jesus, then I can promise, just like the Magi, all of us will go home by a different way. And it'll be a way, it'll be a journey that leads to life. Friends, after 2,000 years, wise women and wise men still seek him. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for 
your very presence with us, that in your desire to seek us, and the scripture reminds us that before we sought you, you were seeking us, and you have come into our presence. How grateful we are for that. But now help us in this new year of 2019 to again renew our commitment to you to offer ourselves for your will. Whatever that will may be, wherever the journey may lead. And help us to be content. To know that even though we don't know where the journey will lead, help us to be content to know that you lead ahead of us and walk ahead of us. And also beside us along the way. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to come to the communion table here. Um, seems like an appropriate way to begin our first chapel. We're also going to uh, offer ourselves in covenant renewal. There is a prayer we're going to utter together here for the bulletin in a minute. It is a prayer that is very common in the Wesleyan tradition, uh, but it's also actually ecumenical because Wesley actually uh, adapted it from a Puritan watch night service uh, that was published in 1662. And so um, we gathered together to just offer ourselves to God for whatever God may have for us. Um, and so we will come forward in a minute for communion. You will be offered a piece of, you know, it is, it is sniffling season, we know that, so we're going to be as sanitary as possible. So uh, Kathy Collar's gonna come forward in a minute and we have the holy hand sanitizer up here and we'll take care of that. And then you will be handed a piece of the bread and if you would dip it in the cup and partake and then you may return to your seats. So friends, this is the table of the Lord. And it's to be made ready for those who love him and want to love him more. And so come. You who have been here for often and have come often to the table of the Lord, or perhaps haven't come in a while, come. We invite all of you who have tried, who have been faithful, who have attempted to be faithful, and also those who have failed. We invite everyone to the table of the Lord. Christ invites all of us.
to offer together in unison our prayer of covenant renewal. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee, or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am Thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 